After we treat a patient with LCH, we have to follow them for many years because there are long-term problems that are from the disease itself and perhaps also from the therapies. We know that about 20% of all patients are going to get diabetes insipidus. Some patients with uh, bone involvement will have problems that lead to either changes in the length of their legs or problems with their spine leading to diff some orthopedic problems. They might have uh, problems in their lung or liver from the disease causing fibrosis that could affect the function of those organs. They might have hearing problems from uh, involvement of the mastoid bone or around the ears. And of course, if a child has loss of teeth early on, it might affect the way the permanent teeth come in. There are problems with the eye, and very rarely there are associated cancers that we know that LCH patients have perhaps a slightly higher incidence of lymphoma and leukemia and maybe some other uh, cancers, but it's not a very, very large percentage. We do like to accumulate uh, knowledge about these cases to help us understand how the immune system may be impaired and give uh, patients a somewhat higher incidence of these uh, diseases. We've learned recently from uh, some long-term studies of children that those with the disease in the mastoid and orbit and the temporal bone have these uh, problems we call CNS risk that I mentioned earlier. And this is a special category of patients that we really are very interested in evaluating and following to see if we can prevent the long-term problems and learn what it is about their uh, rate of uh, change of the disease or amount of the disease at the time of presentation that would give us some hint as to why they would or would not get these, uh, these difficulties. One of the first things that was learned was that the uh, children have a high incidence of the diabetes insipidus. And when we looked back and found that if we compared patients who were treated just with surgery or one drug or radiotherapy, they had a 40% incidence of diabetes insipidus, but those that were treated with velbin and prednisone had a 20%. So that was half as many patients, and still a, a, quite a large number, but not as many as if uh, we had only a single treatment. The really striking thing that we've learned about these uh, individuals is that once they get the di diabetes insipidus, other problems can occur. And one of them is um, neurodegenerative disease. So if you look at diabetes insipidus over all patients, it, it, happen, it may be the presenting symptom in a few of them, maybe one or two percent. By five years, uh, up to 10 percent are going to have diabetes insipidus, and by 15 years after diagnosis, overall it will be between 15 and 20 percent of all histiocytosis patients. But for those who have the uh, those CNS wrist lesions, it's quite a bit higher, as I mentioned. And once they get diabetes insipidus, well, what else can happen? They, the diabetes insipidus happens because the back part of the pituitary gland is affected by the LCH. If the disease moves to the front part of the gland, then they have other difficulties, including growth problems, thyroid uh, problems, and also their sexual maturation can be affected. In two studies, one from the French and one from the Histocyte uh, Society Data Center in Vienna, it's been shown that up to 50% of the pa patients with diabetes insipidus will get other endocrine problems. So that's the reason we have to be very careful about trying to prevent this and uh, doing something about it once it happens. So this graph just shows that the risk of the other endocrinopathies occurring uh, sometime after the onset of diabetes insipidus gets up to 50% by 10 years, but it's increasing ever gradually ever from the first year on. The neurodegenerative disease is really not well understood, uh, and we think that it uh, is really dependent upon the alertness of the physicians in following up. And the more we've talked about this, the more cases that are coming to our attention because it's now becoming more generally known by physicians in the pediatric uh, oncology community and, and also in the adult oncology group. So in a, one way, the frequency of it depends on how close we, we follow patients and how closely we, we look at them with special neurologic tests and MRIs. We found in one group of patients 
were followed that uh, had uh, evidence of uh, this neurodegenerative uh, changes on their MRI films, that half of them had symptoms. And the symptoms mean trouble walking, ataxia, trouble riding, dysmetria, sometimes trouble talking, dysarthria. They might also have behavior or learning problems. When we looked at a, all of uh, a group of uh, diabetes insipidus patients, 76% uh, of those had uh, evidence of some ner of the neurodegeneration in the MRI that was done with follow-up of greater than uh, five years. Not all of these patients had the symptoms of problems with balance and writing, but they did have some suspicious changes in their brain which need further follow-up. What causes this? There have been very few brain biopsies done in these patients, so we only have a limited idea. It doesn't seem like the longer Han cells are hiding out in the brain and causing the problems, but rather T lymphocytes. Another part of the immune system has migrated into the parts of the brain that affect our balance and writing and speech and caused damage to the nerves there, such that the nerves have lost their, their insulation. And without the insulation, you know, electricity shorts out. And so the nerves are not working. And this causes the problem with the uh, speech and movement. This is a typical MRI image showing these white areas that are distinctly abnormal in the back part of the brain called the cerebellum. Occasionally, a, a radiologist who is not familiar with this condition might think this is scarring or evidence of a stroke or evidence of a tr uh, treatment-related problem, but this is a very characteristic uh, finding in the neurodegenerative LCH. Some patients also get growth of some cells in the fluid parts of their brain called the ventricles and causing plugging up of the ventricles and what we call hydrocephalus or water on the brain where the ventricle gets way too big because it's like a lake that was dammed up and it gets bigger and bigger. Fortunately for this patient with some chemotherapy treatment and radiotherapy, we got these masses to reduce in size. And in fact, he had some neurodegenerative changes which improved after the ERA-C and he uh, improved his writing and his balance and his learning abilities. So this is still a challenging disease. We've learned a lot over the years with our therapeutic studies that have been organized through the Histocyte Society. And there are a lot of very good research programs going on throughout the world today trying to investigate the cause of this disease and learn more about the biology. But until we learn more about the biology, we won't have specific therapies which really target the problem. So we have to find out what is the specific problem that is causing the disease so we can have those kind of therapies.